Um, we're probably only about seven miles away. Yeah, seven miles is uh, close enough to expect to see white sharks um, around. Uh, it's not an uncommon thing, uh, but every other time there's been a whale uh, floating on the surface uh, in that vicinity uh, of the Fairlands, uh, there has been sharks. I mean, did you hesitate at all? What went through your mind? What was going through my mind instantaneously was like two months ago we had a dead blue whale and the sharks were feeding on it at the surface. Actually from the moment I got the phone call I was thinking about sharks uh, up until um, when I got back at the boat after the whale, after, as we were departing after saving the whale and I was thinking about sharks. Uh, it's shark season at the Farallons. Uh, you have a, we had uh, around the whale we had a huge oil slick. Uh, with all the blubber being cut into by the ropes, it produced a lot of oil. Um, so you had a you had a, an oil slick that went probably for more than a mile. Um, so there was definitely a great scent for the white sharks uh, in the area. Uh, my my I hesitated when I first jumped in, and I just thought, okay, man, better watch out because you know there, there could be a shark around here. So I was definitely thinking about that. It really it. I wasn't so much where I was afraid, but it was definitely uh, in my mind that uh, you know, I could encounter something bigger than me out there. Was everyone aware of that, or did you kind of keep that to yourself from the other volunteers? Um, I think every, uh, the other divers they were aware of it. You know, they knew everything. They knew it was shark season. Um, I didn't really, I didn't announce it too much, but it was every definitely in everybody's mind. Um, Tim, the first guy in the water with me, I definitely gave him a heads up right before we jumped in. And I told him, like, okay, if we have a shark, you don't take your eyes off it, you know, don't swim away. You know, I, so I gave him a basic one-on-one -on -one class of how to, uh, how to deal with a white shark two minutes before we jumped in. How do you deal with a white shark? The way you deal with a white shark is you just do not take your eyes off it. Um, eye contact typically uh, will keep them at bay. Um, they aren't used to being looked at. Uh, if they see you, uh, they can usually recognize that you're not a food source, so you're pretty much okay. It's uh, what gets most people here, and you know, in other Californias, the surfers is the uh, mistaken identity. Um, you know, people never see it coming. It's not the shark you see that you need to worry about. It's the shark you don't see, uh, and the shark that hasn't recognized you as a food source or as a non-food source yet. And that whale had been wrapped up and distressed for how long? Uh, the boat that first found it was called uh, the Prime Time. Um, they were on scene about 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, they tried to radio uh, Mick directly, but they weren't able to. Uh, they were too far out. Uh, but they, did, were, they were able to relay a phone call to another boat. Uh, who was able to actually use a cell phone and call Mick at home. Reports indicate that the whale was struggling, um, was started at 8 o'clock. Uh, the gear, the crab trap gear was run the day before and it was clean. So we know the whale was, it was less than 24 hours that the whale was entangled. Yeah, the ropes were very much inside the flesh of the whale. They were, uh, they literally were cut into the whale from the tension of it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, two to three inches deep, uh, they went into the blubber. Um, it was, you know, I mean, just being encased inside the blubber, just wrapped around tight. Not only one rope, but layers upon layers of rope, twisted around together, just cutting it through the whale. How did that happen so fast? Were the whales frantic struggle against it? I would imagine uh, the boat on site, the prime time on site, uh, the first ones to see it. Um, they said they saw the whale thrashing. Uh, they saw it moving about, uh, splashing, twisting, rotating around. So during that time, I would, uh, I would assume that that is when it got tangled up and the stress of the weight of the crab traps um, and the thrashing about 
cut, use, you know, the rope was basically just cut into the lever. Is a crab trap, head, crab trap heavy? A crab trap weighs about uh, 100 pounds empty. Um, these were there for a full day and right at the beginning of, the, of crab season. So, I mean, we had a trap last year filled with 56 crab. I don't think you could put more crab in there if you wanted to, and that probably weighed 300 pounds. Uh, when I saw the crab traps, a lot of them were full completely. Um, so, and there was at least, I would estimate the amount of crab traps tied to this whale was about a dozen to 20. You know, it was a 3,000 pound anchor attached to its tail. So it's fighting against this weight to keep coming to the surface to breathe before it sinks to its doom. Yeah, yeah. This, uh, the whale when we found it was drowning. Uh, how long were you in the water? Uh, we were in the water from start to finish about three and a half hours. It took quite a uh, long time for the four of us to uh, completely detangle the whale and get everything off it. Four in the water. And this was uh, adult whale? Uh, yes, we believe the whale was an adult whale. Um, it was about 45 feet long. Uh, it was a female. Um, so, uh, it was full grown adults weighing up probably, most people have told me that's about a 50 ton whale. So it's a big, big object in the water to avoid. Are you picturing its tail smashing you or its body rolling on top of you? Uh, I mean, what's going through your head? When I first got in the water, I was thinking, uh, what exactly is this animal going to do? It's been stressed out, now it sees something that it's not familiar with. Uh, I was definitely worried about that. When I first approached the whale, visibility wasn't that good. I put my head in the water and see the visibility is about 20 feet. Put my head above the water and see that I can see the whale only 25 feet away from me. Slowly swimming to the whale, um, getting closer and closer, inching my way, uh, I had a great uh, frightening experience um, where next thing I know the pectoral fin came up out of the water and crashed nearly six inches away from my head and the pectoral fin on a humpback whale is like the size of an airplane wing um, you know 15 20 feet long four feet wide a foot thick a few ton a few tons and literally have it come up and then splash back down uh, right in front of your head and I was saying to myself that's gonna hurt <laughs> That's gonna hurt a lot. Um, so, uh, but you, but you kept going for it. Yeah, no. At that time, I kind of, I at once, once that whale, once that fin came down, I, I, I stepped back. I swam. I took a few swim strokes backwards and hung out. I told uh, Tim, who's right behind me, I said, "Okay, hang out here. Let's, you know, let's see what's going to happen." And uh, we had staged the boats where we had the big boat. We had the small Zodiac, we had Tim, and then me. So the idea of the whale attacked me and I went unconscious, Tim would pull me out. And the big boat would move up in between me and the whale. Um, so we had a line of protection and I put my face into my whole team there, that knowing that, you know, I was going to be okay, you know, hopefully. Did you feel like that was a warning uh, splash with that fin or was that just part of it splashing period? No, the, uh, the warning shot, uh, the pectoral fin coming down close to my head was definitely a uh, stay back. That was uh, my one and only warning from the whale. Um, it was definitely did not want me around. Um, from my experience with other times with whales, I've had them move the pectoral fins back and forth in front of me uh, to like someone shooing, them, shooing somebody else away or holding their hand out stopping somebody. Um, that's the image I get when I think of a whale putting his pectoral fin out. Um, so we hung out there. We hung out there for probably three minutes just waiting to see what the whale was going to do at that time. And uh, everybody's like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And I'm telling everybody, okay, shut up because, you know, I got to, you know, I'm taking this one step at a time. I got to, I'm not going to give up. Uh, a lot of the guys said, okay, let's back up. I said, hold on. Let's see what this thing does. Um, at that point, it was, you know, this is, this is the turning point of the whole game. I mean, it was, it was. I remember it, you know, like it was just a few minutes ago. The whale came up on a breath, came up, put its eye above the surface, looked at me, and I could tell it was looking at me, and just stayed there. And I told the guys, okay, this is it. 
You know, he's looking at me. I'm looking at him. This is it. And I told Tim, okay, here I go. So I swam to the, swam right to the whale, and I got there, and you know, and I put my hand on next to the whale, right next to the eye, and the eye was, you know, just right there, and I could see. You know, I could see its eye moving back and forth. When I moved back and forth, the eye was following me. And I was stroking the whale, and I was just, you know, to this day, I'm not even sure whether I said it, but I know I said it in my brain. I don't know if I said it out loud, but I was like, I'm here to help you. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm here to help. The whale stayed above the surface, with its eye above the surface. And at that point, I was still touching it, rubbing its skin around its eye. And I knew that it was looking at me. I was moving back and forth. Put my hand up. Called Tim. Tim, come on over. Come on, get over here. You gotta check this out, man. This is almost. This is the wildest thing you're gonna see. And he came over. We we're shoulder to shoulder, and you can see the whale's eyes just moved back and forth between the two of us. And we both had its hands on it. And then slowly the whale dropped down below the surface. And pretty much from that point on, it didn't move. The only time it would move, it would slowly move, come up to the surface take a breath and then go back down it didn't have any aggressive movements at that from that point on um, it just relaxed it knew, I think it knew that we were there to help um, I'm not saying I talked to the whale or it could understand me but um, it reacted like okay you know I'm done these guys hopefully they're here to help me so and we did when it went under Back under the surface, did that make it easier for you to free it? Was that like aiding in the process? Or? Yeah. Uh, um, when the whale went back under the surface, it was, I mean, the size of a whale, everybody thinks the whale is so big, 45 feet big, 45 feet long, uh, 50 tons. I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a big item. But on the surface, it's just the size of a coffee table, I mean, a kitchen table, just the top, top, you know, spine of the back showing at the surface, only maybe nine inches above the water. Um, you can cut to one of the pictures that we've you've seen where it's just, just the back end and a few crab pot buoys flowing on the surface. I mean, it was literally fine to nail it, a needle in a haystack, 17 miles offshore, and we happened to find a whale that was just barely above the surface. So uh, having the whale just uh, below the surf, just right at the surface right there, we were able to actually at that point, once it's, uh, it relaxed and stayed still, um, I swam around it, looking exactly what we were up against. And you know, one of the things I got to stress here was this was just not a whale tied up. Um, like say, when people, when cowboys tie up their their steer, their bulls during the rodeos, this is a whale. This is we estimated there was about a hundred feet of crab chop rope uh, floating around this whale. I mean, not 100 feet, sorry, one mile of crab trap uh, line tied up to this whale and floating around it. So it was literally swimming in, in a sea of spaghetti along with the whale. Uh, and then it was a huge entanglement problem. You're constantly getting your fins caught, your mask caught, your hands caught. So um, it was grab ropes, grab ropes, tie them in a knot, cut them, cut them, cut them, sink them. Um, the ropes were, uh, had weights on them, so they, they were able to sink. But every time you move, you were catching another rope. Um, I felt comfortable. I, I, to my belief, I believe that the whale was relaxed enough and wasn't going to thrash around anymore. I felt comfortable swimming in between the ropes, getting entangled them, untangling myself, cutting them, and then slowly working my way around this whale. Um, at that point, once we were once we were around with the whale, it was. Uh, really evident how bad this whale was tied up. It was, the ropes went around its mouth, around its head, figure eights around its mouth, and you know, jaw. Uh, those ropes went down to the pectoral fins and kind of put them together all the way down to its tail. So it was literally hog tied. Um, it was a sad thought. And uh, once we, I inspected the whale and saw what was going around, going on, uh, me and Tim, we headed back to the smaller boat, and we devised a plan. And everybody says, so what do you think? What are we going to do? And I told them, I don't know what we can do. I think we're looking at a dead whale. The whale just doesn't know it yet. And that was pretty much my exact words. Um, I, I didn't believe, even though this whale was very 
calm at this point was allowing us to dive around it, that it was going to let us cut into it, cut around it with the amount of material to set it free. So. This whale basically, so there had been a mile or so of crab traps, and the whale had been struggling for so long that it basically pulled that mile's worth of ropes to itself and was entangled at all. Yeah, uh, the entanglement, I believe, how it started uh, with the whale was the whale just happened to catch one, one line coming straight down. Crab pat, uh, the crab pot buoy floats on the surface, has a line that's 180 feet long, and uh, which has a crab pot on the very bottom to get the crabs. Uh, the whale got entangled with one, and that was like a pendulum flicking back and forth, picking up every other crab trap around. Um, and the one got two, which got the third and the fourth, and probably a whole, someone's whole, they line them up so the boats can go. Every two minutes they can pick up another crab trap as they go, so they're all in a line. The whale just went down the wrong line and just picked them all up. So, it was sad. Tell me about actual cutting, I mean, given so that people would have an idea of just how difficult it was, you know, how much physical effort it took to cut in and how deep you were going and how much tolerance this animal was showing. Cutting around the whale, this is an amazing story. I mean, uh, you would never think an animal would allow you to do such a thing. I was overfilled with joy, swam up to the surface as fast as I can from 30 feet and just screamed, woohoo! You know, it's free, it's free. I know I have this whale coming right up at me, and it was like a small moving bus coming at me, if you could describe it any other way, or a Mack truck, because it's even scarier. And, and here it comes, this whale is directly from below me, coming up, coming up, coming up, real close. And I'm just thinking, like, here we go. I just saved you, and you're going to run me over. <laughs> <laughs>